Hello, everyone. Welcome to the 20 years since 9-11 Solidarity Teach-In, hosted by the Building Movement Project and Solidarity Is. My name is Deepa Iyer. We are live now on the Building Movement Project's YouTube and Facebook Live channels, and we welcome all of you to this online community space. I want to start by telling you a little bit about the goals of our teach-in. First and foremost, we are hoping that this is an opportunity for all of us to understand history, especially when it comes to movements for change over the past 20 years. We're also hoping to learn and share solidarity practices, possibilities, and gaps, and how we can build a vision for collaboration. We're so glad that you are here. As we open up our community space, I want to start with a few community agreements. We want to remember and honor the lives that were lost on September 11th and the survivors, both during the day of the attacks, as well as in the aftermath of backlash and state violence here in the US and around the world. We also acknowledge that this set of conversations may bring up some discomfort and trauma, and we want to encourage you to stretch your limits while also setting boundaries in the practice of your self-care. And of course, while we attempted to be as inclusive as possible with today's teaching, we know that at times it will feel incomplete and insufficient, and we're gonna be sharing out resources and information both here as well as on social media on Twitter. And finally, we encourage the practice of being critical and loving at once, always loving community, but being able to critique systems in principled struggle with each other. So today's teaching would not be possible without the amazing staff at the Building Movement Project. I want to shout out Catherine Foley, Anna Castro, Sophia Fauzi, Kitty Hugh, Shelby House, Sean Thomas Breitfeld, and Francis Penrider. The Building Movement Project is a national nonprofit organization. We aim to strengthen the nonprofit sector and movement spaces to advance social change. And we do that through research, tools, training materials. You'll see some of those on the slide here. We support place-based work in New Mexico and Detroit, and we also host the project Solidarity Is. A little bit about Solidarity Is. There are three roles that we play on Solidarity Is. First, we are a builder. We aim to support activists and organizations through movement education, like Solidarity Schools, which Anna Castro runs, and teach-ins like these. We're also a storyteller. We uplift stories of solidarity through the Solidarity Is This podcast. And we're a weaver. We bring organizations and activists together to build analysis and relationships. And that's really the role of the weaver that is connected to the conversation and teaching that we're having today. We here today are anchoring this teach-in with members of the Solidarity Summits. The Solidarity Summits were gatherings of movement leaders representing various communities and coalitions for justice. And they originated back in 2014 to actually bridge the gaps between Arab, Middle Eastern, Muslim, and South Asian communities and organizations and Black, Latinx, and Indigenous organizations. Through place-based learning in New Orleans, Albuquerque, and, New and Murfreesboro, Tennessee, this group of leaders has built relationships and experimented with joint projects through the framework of solidarity. And that's why this teaching is anchored by them today. So what can you expect today? We are going to start with a little bit of anchoring, and then we're going to go into three panels. We're going to first explore connections and commonalities. Then we will talk about co-conspiratorship. And then we'll be exploring collaboration. Finally, we'll do a synthesis and provide more resources before we close. I want to start by anchoring us in a little bit of history, knowing completely that it is impossible to do that in a few moments, but feeling that it is important for us to have some points of reference and common themes. So in the wake of 9-11, we saw both hate violence and state violence happening in the United States and around the world. Hate violence happened in many ways. It happened, for example, with the murder of Balbir Singh Sodhi, a Sikh American man who was actually killed 20 years ago tomorrow. 
And that is the anniversary that we'll be talking about as well. We also saw vandalism at places of worship. We saw school bullying and workplace discrimination. In addition, we saw the emergence of state violence, including the policies and regulations of government agencies at the federal and state level that profiled, surveilled, detained, and deported members of the Arab, Middle Eastern, South Asian, Muslim communities. These include, for example, arbitrary detentions of people who are called the disappeared. They include programs like special registration that required boys and men 16 years older, 16 years old and older from 25 majority Muslim countries to report to immigration authorities. The Patriot Act that expanded surveillance powers and the opening of Guantanamo Bay and of course the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq. As you'll see on the next slide, by the time we got to the 10 year anniversary of 9-11, the state violence continued. We saw the Park 51 controversy and opposition to mosque construction all over the country. We saw that in Congress, there were hearings on Muslim extremism, and we saw state level programs around surveillance, countering violent extremism, and the NYPD's mapping and infiltration programs. We also learned that hate violence had not ebbed. In 2012, we heard the news of the massacre at the Sig Gurdwara in Oak Creek, Wisconsin, and the murders of three Palestinian Americans in North Carolina in 2015. The years between 2016 and 2020, as we see on the next slide, felt for many people in the community like a second backlash. We saw the emergence of the Muslim ban and then the African ban, a climate of hate and bigotry, and the unfair conditions in which asylees and refugees were treated at the border and in the interior of this country. At the same time, there is another story that's important to track and share. And as you'll see on the next slide, that is a story about movements for change, solidarity, and power. We've seen the growth of a field of Black, Arab, Middle Eastern, Muslim, South Asian, and Sikh community groups around the country that have been mobilized in the wake of 9-11 uh, and its aftermath. We've seen campaigns to end NSEERS and the Muslim and African bans. We've seen coalitions in New York City to stop profiling through the Community Safety Act and in the Bay Area to stop the Joint Terrorism Task Forces there. And in 2021, on the 20th anniversary, we see a bold vision, Muslim abolitionist futures through a coalition of organizations and a resolution introduced in Congress by four women of color leaders that finally acknowledges the government targeting endured by communities. So what does this movement history teach us? How can the lessons from the past 20 years help us to address the generational crises that are before us today? That's what we're gonna start to hear about with our first conversation on connections and commonalities within Arab, Muslim, Middle Eastern, South Asian Sikh communities. Before I turn it over to start that panel, I just wanna provide a couple of reminders this event, as you know, is being live streamed to our YouTube and Facebook platforms. It will be saved on those platforms as well. But throughout this conversation, it is a teach-in and we want to make sure that you are learning with us and also giving us information. So we want you to engage with us on Twitter. You'll see our handles on the slide as well as the hashtags that you can use to share your reflections. How has the post 9-11 moment affected you? and your communities? What are the issues that you're thinking about right now? What are the questions that you have? Tweet at us and we'll make sure that we address those throughout the teaching. Again, the hashtags are 20 years since and September 11th. So now I'm going to turn it over to my sister, Simran Noor, who is connected to two organizations I deeply love. She is on the project team of the Building Movement Project and she's also the chair of the board of South Asian Americans Leading Together. Simran? Thank you so much, Deepa. Um, such an honor to be here with you and with Building Movement and to help anchor this first conversation and teach in um, exploring commonalities and connections. 
Uh, we know, right, in, in our movements, um, the importance of building shared values, uh, how important it is to have strategies that allow us to connect, build power. And we recognize that in times of crisis, it's even more difficult to, um, to do that work uh, when we're in rapid response mode. The organizations and leaders in this first conversation um, have much to share on this topic, uh, have been working for many, many years uh, across the timeline that Deepa so beautifully outlined. Um, and so I really just wanna give space and, and um, give gratitude to uh, our four um, amazing um, panelists that will be joining me on screen in just a second. Um, so with us, we have Maya Berry from the Arab American Institute, Marguerite Hill from the Muslim Anti-Racism Collaborative, Sachit Kaur from the Sikh Coalition, and Lakshmi Sri Dharan from South Asian Americans Leading Together. Thank you, uh, incredible panelists, for joining us. Getting on the stream yard. Okay, y'all are, you all are here. Thank you. Um, so I will uh, want to start, um, friends, uh, hope hope it's okay to call you friends. I um, want to start by asking each of you to share how are you and your communities affected in the week after 9-11? And Lakshmi, maybe we can start with you um, and then uh, go from there. Sure. Yeah. Um, I feel like so much of understanding how our communities were affected in the week of 9-11 has been a learning process for me. Um, having joined SALT so many years later, um, I really credit our founding ED, Deepa Iyer, uh, who started us off on this panel um, for, for the deep learning that um, I have been able to experience over the last several years at SALT. Um, and so, you know, South Asian American communities, and um, I think the data that we've collected over the years continues to show those particularly racialized as Muslim, uh, were deeply impacted by both the surge in state violence and hate violence that Deepa said at the top of the call. Um, and so, you know, with the interpersonal violence, of course, this included murders and physical assaults and verbal threats and all the damages to the homes and businesses and places of worship. Um, and then on the, on the state violence side, we saw just so much reaction and repression by our government that was so severe, um, but also built um, on existing systems of surveillance, policing and racial profiling that were perfected on the backs of other communities of color. Um, and then were specifically targeted in um, unique ways um, on predominantly Muslim communities in the US. And so I think, um, you know, several organizations um, that are represented here on the call today and Justice for Muslims Collective and others um, have characterized this um, and talked about this as the policies of the war on terror. And this is both abroad and domestically, as we've seen um, the fallout of an unjust war in Afghanistan happening here 20 years later. Um, and so I think just to shift gears again back to the interpersonal hate violence, which really spiked as a result of the state violence, um, a big part of SALT's work was to acknowledge and document and address um, all of this, which was very much neglected by our federal government. And so our organization mobilized quickly to start this critical documentation and demand accountability from law enforcement um, around hate crimes. And I think one of the big things that we saw and continue to contend and struggle with today is that um, is, the, is the real divorcing of this interpersonal violence from state violence. And I think one of the examples from those early days that um, has been so harmful uh, is when former President Bush, you know, recited these very empty words around, um, uh, you know, not attacking Muslim communities. Um, and yet, uh, as he said that, uh, he was, his administration was implementing those policies of the war on terror. So we heard Patriot Act and Sears Guantanamo Bay and really set up an infrastructure that has been expanded to date 20 years later. Um, and I'll just say quickly to wrap up that I think um, NSEERS in particular um, was so devastating, um, rounding up over 80,000 men and boys ages 16 and up from Muslim majority countries, um, setting up 13,000 for deportation, um, resulting in zero terrorism related convictions, which was originally supposedly the purpose of this program. And so I think the decimation of entire specifically working class uh, communities in New York City is is something that we continue to live with today. Um, 
And I think another, uh, you know, hugely devastating consequence was also uh, many of the gender-based violence organizations that SALT works with uh, within our national coalition, which I'll talk about later, um, also heard how calls from survivors of gender-based violence also dropped severely during that time um, because of the deep mistrust um, in government as a result of this state violence. Thanks, Lakshmi. Um, Marjorie, um, and please correct me if I'm mispronouncing your name. I apologize in advance for that, but can, uh, can you share or layer in what's coming up for you? Yeah, I mean, so much is coming up and just a little, my, my name is pronounced with a hard G, so like Margarita, um, but I, I go by, by um, Marjorie also, I'll answer to, to anything but margarine, you know, people used to tease me with that. So um, yeah, it's, it's definitely a lot is, is coming up and, and I'm part of multiple communities. I'm African-American, um, I'm Muslim, you know, clearly identified as Muslim. Um, I am a Santa Clara University Bronco, which is a which is a Catholic university that was was also impacted. But also just like that student community, what was the vulnerabilities that Muslim students faced during 9/11, and what was the pressure? Like that is something that really comes to mind because we weren't really truly equipped to to deal with the kind of onslaught right right the, the questions the suspicion um the calls to answer for what happened um for the international students we didn't even know how to hold space or support um or to organize for for our peers the international students who were who got rounded up right whose families ended up on no fly lists um we were concerned because of political organizing, right? There, there was a deep repression of dissent, right? Um, and and um, there was a deep fear as far as, because we knew we were already subjected to, to the type of surveillance. We were already subjected to, to um, policies that targeted us, but we knew that this was getting ramped up. And the interpersonal, right, the, the, fear of my, I, I feared for my own personal safety because in that, you know, the first few days, we didn't know what was going to happen um, and and not being able to mourn. So there's a lot of the kind of the, the psychological terror of being, you know, being victims of terrorism, right? That we were under attack, but also knowing that history. And I remember asking my family, I'm one of the few Muslims in my family and I, and I asked them, I asked my mom and brother and I was like, would you support me for what, what would come next? And, you know, the, and what would they know as working class African-Americans? But it was just having that, like having that difficult conversation. Um, obviously, there was a lot of interpersonal attacks on on people that I knew um at the time I wasn't visibly muslim but the the person the interpersonal from the um burning of a christian church the arson right the um islamic school that I was a substitute teacher for when I was when I was a student volunteer um they had to seek protection from the very agencies that would target all of us and um it was just such a such a difficult time and I'm, and I'm just really trying to think about like what's coming up and it was like a lot of things that we did repress and trying to respond to that moment of being suspects um, but also being victimized by the interpersonal um, discrimination, these the, the, the acts. And then as the state policies came, we were also deeply worried and affected and not having the tools to, to challenge those. Thank you so much for sharing that and um, really beautiful to be able to hear it. I mean, though very painful from, you know, from the many kind of layers of identity that you carry and obviously share and shape the work that you do. So thank you. Um, Sajit, what about for, for you and the Sikh community? Yeah, um, so I'll start with a story. Um, I, just to kind of put in perspective, I think a, a lot of what we are all saying of how our communities were feeling. Um, we had lots of family members that um, worked in New York City. And so there was a lot of trying to figure out where everyone was and getting them out. And 
my sister-in-law um, lived in Long Island at the time and she was trying to figure out how her husband, my brother, my cousin brother was getting back um, and waiting on him. And she ended up making a trip to the train station. And on the way there, she saw another sick man in a turban and she feared for his safety in a way that I think we are all explaining. Um, for context, she's like four foot 10, four foot 11. And I'm not exaggerating. She's a very small, very petite woman. And she literally, a stranger, a sick man, she did not know, did not recognize, told him to get in the car and she'll drop him home. And he was just like being polite and saying like, no, like, it's okay. Like I am, I'm not too far from here. And she said, absolutely not. And got out of the car and basically put him in the, physically put him in the car because she was so fearful for his safety, for her husband's safety, for every family member that every community member that we knew, because you didn't have to tell a Sikh, you didn't have to tell a Muslim, you didn't have to tell a brown person that the backlash was coming. They knew because hate is not new in our country. 9-11 um, was just another pivotal turning point and one that I think was a massive flashpoint. But again, I, I, Lakshmi said this in the very beginning, um, it highlighted the really systemic problems that already existed and further amplified them and created more destructive ones. And so um, that type of fear was just inherent. And to be honest, that hasn't gone away 20 years later. Like the feeling of our communities being targeted is still very real. Um, and it's not just targeted in the ways that I just described or in the way Bulbir Singh Sordi was killed on September 15th and tomorrow's the 20th anniversary of that. And he was the first person killed in the backlash, but there were, we had 300 reports of incidences in the first month and we had an access database and didn't have access to the social media that we currently do right now. So imagine if we, in that time, during Yahoo groups had 300 reports of incidences against the Sikh community, like imagine the actual magnitude that exists. I am still hearing from community members to this day that I never knew how they were physically assaulted on September 11th, the 12th, the 13th, the 14th, 15th, and, and the days following. And so the policies that Lakshmi and Marguerite that you have so succinctly described, and I, I won't get into those, but it's not just that interpersonal of like how another community person in our community will maybe target us, but also how businesses and employers create policies. Um, how classrooms and how our education system are marginalizing our communities and not allowing for these histories to be taught. Like we're heading to Arizona tomorrow for Bulbir Singh Sodi's anniversary. Sikhi was going to be taken out completely from the state standards a couple of years ago. And so forget Bulbir Singh Sodi being taught and that history being taught in schools, the whole community was about to be eradicated from the state standards. And so just like the, the ramifications of how our communities actually have to fight for our existence continues very much to this day. And I think that's a lot about the conversation around solidarity and like community building that's really important is that flashpoint was really problematic in many ways, but it was also a flashpoint for all of us to be in this space and to be created. And it's given us this responsibility to carry forward. And while it's not a burden that's fair, I'm really deeply appreciative of everyone that's here and all those watching um, because we are creating impact together. Thank you so much. Maya. Um, thank you. Um, Again, it's wonderful to be with with all of you, even for a difficult uh, anniversary. Um, you know, I'm gonna, I'll tell you a story as well. Um, when I first moved to Washington D.C., um, it was to work at the Arab American Institute, and it was a very long time ago. I was there uh, specifically because um, the institute had been set up in 1985 for the civic engagement and political empowerment of Arab Americans, a community that had historically been targeted. Uh, primarily because of our engagement in politics. You were allowed to be an Arab American um, as a doctor, you were allowed to be an Arab American as a teacher, but the moment we sort of stepped into the political space and particularly stepped into advocacy on the issue of Palestinian human rights, um, our presence was, was unwelcome. And um, the Institute existed specifically so that we can make sure our community was able to fully participate in our uh, civic life in all its forms, including our politics. And it was after being there for a wonderful five years, um, I had the opportunity um, to go work for a member of Congress. At the time, um, I really wondered, I kind of, I was working on issues at the Institute related to something called secret evidence 
which is a provision from the old 1950s immigration law that was being targeted uh, and used against um, uh, Arab immigrants. Um, and it is, as I explained, it's secret evidence. Uh, we were dealing with something called CAPS, which was an automated passenger profiling system that airlines were using uh, to profile people while they were flying. Um, and working on all of these issues, and, and um, I went to work on the Hill because specifically my boss at the time was really heavily engaged on the issue of secret evidence and the way that it was targeting both Arab Americans as well as American Muslims. And I thought, this is great. We'll, we'll, um, I'll have the opportunity to impact policy directly. So when 9-11 happened, the day of 9-11, um, I was in my office in the Rayburn House office building when it happened. And when the first plane hit, uh, we were there and we were all watching it as Hill offices have a TV screen on every single desk. So there are multiple televisions are going and we're all watching it. And I you immediately want to go, oh, goodness, you know, and I really hope this is an accident. Please tell me this is an accident. And that's all you rerun in your head. I want this. This needs to be an, an, an accident. And when the second plane hit, my my the co member of Congress that I work for is in the congressional leadership. And he immediately called our office and said, evacuate now. And it was very clear what was happening um, to all of us at the time. And then you shift to say, regrettably, and if you think about this sort of intellectually, like what a bizarre response, please don't let it be Arabs, please don't let it be Muslims. Um, and, and you have this sense of, you have this response because you know what's coming. We are a community that had been directly impacted by events that we had nothing to do with thousands of miles away in another part of the world. And that's been the, the, the history, <laughs> regrettably, of, of um, our community and how it was affected by 9-11 and before 9-11. Before we had the Patriot Act, we had Richard Nixon and Operation Boulder. Uh, before we had the type of profiling that we see now and, and, and um, what came with NSEERS and others, we had secret evidence. So regrettably, there was a keen awareness that um, uh, we are as a community, I, I say often, you're canary in a coal mine. We sit at the intersection of civil rights and civil liberties. And what happens to our broader American community is in some ways piloted and tested on us in violation of our rights. And it's um, quite unfortunate um, because the, the, for many reasons, um, but the immediate aftermath, um, I mean, folks have talked about hate crime and the surge that we saw. We had so many employment discrimination cases at, at the Institute in the hundreds. We heard from hundreds of people that a, an individual was brought on staff to do nothing other than employment discrimination, which is something we just hadn't done. Um, and it came at a time where in some ways the community was hopeful about what we had done. We had Arab Americans uh, elected at every level of office from your local city council to members of Congress. We were ready to tackle some of these issues. Uh, as I said, the reason I went to the Hill is because I thought I could go ahead and make some progress. And then this happened. <sighs> Thank you, Maya. Just taking a breath, um, uh, you know, to honor all that you, each of you have shared and the depth of impact that this, these events have had on um, you as individuals and on every aspect, right, of the lives of the, the communities that, that we are a part of and that, that you all work with. Um, you know, I'm curious, um, so, you know, really, really robust um, understanding of what took place in the days after and also understanding that this panel is about connections and commonalities and wanting to ask um, how, how did you all build together? How have you since, right, looking back across 20 years, um, how have you built together in times of crisis, especially when the respective communities that you represent and, and serve um, don't always work together? Um, so can you talk a little bit about how have you built internal solidarity across your communities? And I'll just leave it open for anyone maybe to kick us off. I'm happy to quickly start. Um, I think for us, one of the key things, and I'm, I'm really grateful for our founders for doing this, was that we would absolutely not fall into the rhetoric. Um, we are not terrorists, we are not Muslims, or six are not terrorists, six are not Muslims, and making sure that there was no community being thrown under the bus while also being able to um, identify six as six um, and, and create awareness about um, what was happening to the Sikh community. Um, with the rise of xenophobia. And I think 
solidarity is not just about how we stand with one another physically. Um, and, and we have seen that time and time again, but also how we think critically about the role that we play um, in different spaces and how we think about making sure that while we are advocating for ourselves and our communities, that what we do has long-term and greater impact for all marginalized communities and we're not leaving anyone behind in the process. And so for us as an organization, it has been, we do high impact litigation work and the policy and, and the request isn't um, just money for one individual, it's actually policy change across the board and it's actually money that comes off the table first in our litigation work um, because we are looking for policy change across the board. And so that to me is, it's it's how we speak, it's how we stand, and it's 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 in our actions and how we um, uh, ask for change. Yeah, so so I'll I'll jump in. The um, you know, like as as the community that is facing like Islamophobia and 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 whether from the Muslim ban to to the kind of to the policies, it's um, really in many ways the the that the heightened targeting kind of started to build in that solidarity or strengthen some of the solidarity because because then now all Muslims were were suspect, right? That um, they were kind of the, the political spectrum um, that Muslims could operate in. It was just like one side that was more likely to be a little bit kinder, but like one party started to like really target and exclude Muslims or use, you know, Islam as, as a as a kind of punting ball to talk about things. And so I think that there was a, a deeper awareness with, with especially with non-Black Muslims around, okay, like what is the heritage and the legacy of Muslim Americans? And, and over the 20 years, and especially in the second half, like following, especially with 2014, um, is really rooting that within um, Black Muslim struggles, which date back to um, the enslavement of Africans. And so to kind of correct for some of the erasures that did happen was being more inclusive and recognizing that that there is a root cause, right, to anti-Black racism, to xenophobia, to and Islamophobia, and recognize, seeing that our diversity as the most racially diverse religious group, if we're going to really tackle this, we have to get at the root causes. Um, there were rapid response networks and that um, were unprecedented. And we had social media, we had certain tools. Um, what really came out of the, the murder uh, from our three winners of De uh, Dea, Barakat, Yusor, um, and Razan was a rapid response network. Um, and then we had to kind of deploy that multiple times as the onslaught of those policies and crises did occur. And still to this day, like we're still trying to build and strengthen that network to be more inclusive, to center those who are impacted by the criminal justice system, the immigration system and national security system. Thank you. Maya Lakshmi, any anything yeah. to add? Yeah, Maya. I, I would offer that um, one of the first lessons of solidarity that was learned immediately, um, actually the day uh, the first community we heard from um, was the Japanese American community who in the post-World War II era understood what it meant to be targeted and responded saying, we've been here before, how can we help? Um, the point that was made about the solidarity with the sick community, never. I mean, the, the work that was done was incredible. And, and, and as she said, you literally, we never heard that's not us. So those who were Arab Americans or American Muslims or those who were targeted because they were perceived to be, the, the way that communities came together was extraordinary in that regard. Um, and then, you know, the, the other piece of this is, is we learned what it meant to be a securitized community uh, when our government policies came after all of us in a massive profiling that had historically been in place, but that was really amplified in a post 9-11 era. Um, and that's the kind of, I, I can think of nothing more that builds solidarity than to target entire swaths of people for us to come together and defend their rights together. And when you look today, you know, 20 years ago, 9-11 today, the profiling guidance that remain in place they have three blue poles. The first one is for border security. When you define border in the United States, it's within 100 miles of the border. It's national security. 
which anytime you mention counterterrorism or national security, it just trumps civil rights and it's out the door. And the final one is local law enforcement. And all of those three <laughs> allow you to profile Arabs and Muslims and South Asians and Blacks and six. I mean, it's it's exactly what we know happens. And I think that when we see in a very real way that um, um, our fates are generally tied, our ability to defend our rights is tied to defending all of our rights, there's no question that's how people will, will work and organize. Thank you, Maya. Lakshmi, any closing thoughts? Yeah, just really quickly, I think everyone has highlighted such important um, observations and um, and concepts. And I think, you know, for Saul, uh, the, our commitment to continuing our political education has, I think, really helped strengthen our solidarity work. And um, the way we demonstrated that in our hate violence documentation work, I think, is uh, to something Marguerite said earlier around, like, really understanding the root causes and articulating those clearly and those underlying systems that lead to the violence, because I think those bring all of our communities together um, and with other communities of color as well. And so to make sure that as we're documenting that those that's what we continue to highlight. And I'll just say very quickly that I think another lesson um, that we've learned too is that we cannot uh, repurpose the flawed policies and approaches and strategies that our government has used against our communities to fight white supremacist hate violence. Uh, because there is an effort in this government uh, or in this administration, I should say, to use um, the countering violent extremism approach uh, of surveillance and suspicion um, and spying uh, to combat uh, white supremacist hate violence. And I think um, that that's something that many of our communities have come together to push back against because the very existence of that framework will continue to criminalize our communities. And so that's been a really important, um, I think, lesson in solidarity for us. Thanks so much, Lakshmi, um, and and to each of you. Um, you know, I know that we are pressing up against time, and I'm going to hand it over to Deepa. But I just really appreciated um, y'all in this last segment, really um, lifting up the need to address root causes, the need or the ability that y'all and your organizations have been able to um, build infrastructure to respond rapidly, but also take on um, the policies and the systems that are at the very root. Right, and so um, you know, want to ensure that we lift up that long-term sustainability, and ensure that people feel supported to do this work in the long term. So, for all that are listening and joining us, uh, we also want to hear from you about what you've learned from this conversation. Tweet us at hashtag Twenty Years Since, and we will share your responses. So, with that, I just want to thank you, Lakshmi, Maya, Marguerite. Um, and Sajit for your, uh, for your time, for your wisdom, uh, for all that you shared, um, and uh, just immensely grateful and honored uh, to be here with you today. So with that, uh, I'll mm -hmm. turn it over to you, Deepa. Thank you, and I also wanna send my deep gratitude to um, my sisters in the movement. We have been through a lot together, so thank you to all of you. Um, and thanks to all of you who are watching on YouTube, Facebook, um, please let your friends know, let your colleagues know to join us in the teach-in. So um, now um, we're gonna actually have a, um, a poetry break um, as we transition to our next panel on co-conspiratorship. And I'm really excited to welcome Mayle Williams to the teach-in. Uh, Mayle joins us from Houston, Texas. And Mayle is actually part of BMPs and Solidarity is is Power Up Internship Program, where we place um, social justice activists, rising activists with um, social justice organizations through stipends and um, trainings and movement education and peer learning. And Mayel was working at the AFIA Center um, this year. So excited to welcome you into the space, Mayel, and I'm going to hand it over to you. Hello, my performance piece is a poem titled Living Loving Being. This is a fusion of some journal entries and honestly some love letters woven into new material, delicate enough to mold with open air and designed with the hopes of calling ourselves into togetherness. Amidst all the abrasive metallic racket bouncing around these days when we're together, um, I feel still enough and subtle enough to slip back into the earth. 
living, loving being. After I fluff my pillows, a filthy fury slips out of them and into my dreams. I slip out of my dreams and into a bath with sinking machines and floating trees. Let's settle in our moment. You'll take in a breath so deep, it'll shuffle your thoughts like feathers. Then naturally, you'll release your breath. If you practice this, even your heaviest feathers slither shyly from the spotlight. Dust will settle, wind will soften. If you'd like, it will. If you'd like, you'll become so microscopic, so very dense. You'll slip into the earth, onto a bed of warm, salty, chewy clay. You'll wake from a simple slumber, freshly sentient, to find yourself held in the breath of every living, loving being. Someplace you always knew you would return to. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Mayel, for that. And it really reminded me of how and why it is important to create this community of care um, for ourselves and for our communities. Really appreciate you being here and sharing your poem with us. Thank you so much. All right, so um, with that, we're really excited to bring on um, and move on to our next conversation. So we started off exploring connections and commonalities within um, Arab, Muslim, Middle Eastern, South Asian, Sikh communities. And now we're going to go on to talk about um, what does it mean when we are making these connections between communities um, and showing up for each other when it comes to policy issues? Many of the issues that we heard in the last conversation we'll dig into a little bit more. What does it mean to co-conspire? What does it mean when we actually don't do that? So with that conversation or in that conversation, I'm really excited to um, invite some uh, dear friends, Arthi Coley with the Asian Americans Advancing Justice Asian Law Caucus, Linda Sarsour, Empower Change, Ramla Sahid from the Partnership for the Advancement of New Americans, and Vince Warren from the Center for Constitutional Rights. So welcome um, to our teach-in. We have a lot of folks watching who are trying to learn more about the work that you do. So we're so excited you're here. I also want to do a special thank you to Arthi and Vince, who are actually on sabbatical, um, but who said yes when, <laughs> when I asked them to join this conversation. So, you know, there's a lot of love in community here. So welcome. It's so good to see you all. I wish we were in person, um, but here we are. So I want to start um, actually by just diving into the first question, which is um, there are a lot of direct through lines between what happened in the wake of 9-11 and what is happening today, right? Whether that is around national security and immigration policy, whether it's around um, CBE and targeting black identity, black activists, whether it's around the Afghan war and the resettlement. So I wanna ask each of you to share one of these dots, connect the dots for us between what happened in the wake of 9-11 and what is actually transpiring today so people can learn more. So I'm gonna ask um, Arthi to start and then I'll move on to Linda, Vince and Ramla. Arthi. Thanks mm -hmm. Linda, and um, happy to be here Vince. Um, let's check in about sabbatical life afterwards. <laughs> um, so yeah, I was um, in DC or actually Northern Virginia when 9-11 happened and um, the day after 9-11, there was a um, hearing scheduled on the DREAM Act, which is legalization for undocumented folks. And George Bush was president. He had been making noises about, you know, welcoming some sort of legalization, some sort of reform. And um, when 9-11 happened, it all stopped. And um, the immigration, and you know, at that time, immigration advocates, a lot of them weren't even immigrants themselves. I mean, people who are advocates now, it's a whole different world. You have impacted people leading movement space. 
That was not the case. If you were undocumented, you you didn't disclose your status. You weren't, a, I mean, it was just a different world and particularly in DC. And um, so, you know, people were caught so off guard and the Department of Homeland Security was created basically overnight. And um, advocates couldn't stop it. It was a train that was just gonna roll right over people. And the only, like, I remember being in, on calls um, about the creation of the Office of Civil Rights and Civil Liberties within DHS. Like that was kind of the only little thing we were gonna try and get. Um, and so what, what has happened from, I mean, even before that time, but it really increased afterwards. And you saw legislation like the Patriot Act, you saw NCRs, you saw all these programs that people have already mentioned. Um, but the piece that was so painful was that people in the immigrants' rights movement didn't fight the framing of national security. That was the part that was just really hard to take. And there, there just weren't enough folks from Muslim, Arab, South Asian communities in the immigration movement space. And that has shifted over time, but we see this. Um, and one of the most painful things that happened is there was rhetoric to get legalization, which was, we need to know everyone who's in the country, and that's why we need legalization. I mean, literally, that was, <laughs> that, those were the talking points that were created. And yeah. so anyway, um, and to this day, you have legalization, like, you know, we're talking about it again. You, you have, we have to fight really hard against national security provisions. Yeah, I really appreciate you bringing that up because it is one of the gaps, right, in terms of um, looking at our communities through a national security lens and being able to push back against that. That is a through line. Um, Vince, what about you in your work at the Center for Constitutional Rights? Can you share a little bit about a through line um, that you can trace for us? Sure, it's great to be with everybody. Um, and yeah, I, the, the th there are so many through lines, but one I think in particular that we're dealing with now, and I think particularly for folks who are coming to the fight or have been activated around racial justice issues, policing issues, uh, registration issues. Prior to 9-11, you know, on September 10th, the primary targeted community by law enforcement were, were Black folks. And on September 11th, the entire paradigm shifted and not just um, you know, targeting Muslim South Asian and Arab communities because of the 9-11 tax, but also rewiring the entire infrastructure in terms of supporting militarization of local law enforcement. So if you're concerned about stop and frisk, if you're concerned about uh, police killing of black people, if you're concerned about the registration of Muslims, while these issues were, uh, you know, were rampant in society prior to 9-11, they got hyper-organized and hyper-focused post 9-11. So for example, um, when we were, we had been doing at the Center for Constitutional Rights, a stop and frisk case, uh, which we filed two years before 9-11, only to come and find out that five years after uh, September 11, 2001, even though the police department said, hey, we're not doing that anymore, it skyrocketed the stop and frisk. The number of black and brown people stopped. And part of the reason for that that is the massive influx of resources that went to local law enforcement to find, quote unquote, the terrorists, find the, uh, the sleeper cells. And it manifested in essentially a supercharging empowering of the way that police surveil and uh, inhabit all black and brown communities. Another example is CBE, the Countering Vi Violent Extremism uh, program. And this, you know, also stems from right after 9-11, where there was a registration of Muslims. They went around and they expected every Muslim to come in and voluntarily say who they were, where they came from. Um, and that registration program was transmorphed to one that uh, the government was saying, oh, we're not actually trying to, to find out who the Muslim people are. We're just trying to find out who the bad Muslim people are. So if you come forward and essentially spy on your own communities and tell us where the bad folks are, there'll be real benefits uh, to the Muslim community in general. So, I mean, in some, um, 
that when we think about black identity extremism, when we think about um, the way that uh, Muslim South Asians and Arabs are treated now, when we think about police violence, all of that has a direct through line to the superpower charging of local law enforcement post 9-11. Thanks so much, Vince, for laying that trajectory out. Um, I want to go to Linda next. And Linda, you have been like a stalwart in this struggle for justice um, from the Arab American Association of New York um, to Empower Change and the No Muslim Ban Ever campaign. Tell us a little bit about a through line that you can trace um, from then to now. Um, it's so good to be with all of you. I appreciate that, um, Deepa. There's so many, um, and that's what makes the reflection kind of back on 20 years since 9-11 almost seem like we're reliving it again because it's still happening right now. And I guess one um, through line um, that hasn't been mentioned, and I think uh, Artie and, and Vince have done such a wonderful job, is the way in which uh, there has uh, became like a separate justice system for the Muslims. Um, and so when we think about the usage, for example, of secret evidence, uh, when we think about the communication management units in places like Indiana, while there's been a concentrated conversation on Gitmo and closing Guantanamo, but we have Guantanamo North and uh, Muslims make up maybe more than 70% of those that are, who, that are in these type of Guantanamo style prisons um, when we are only 1% of the population. And so our people going in through a system that treats them differently on the offset under this guise of national security, um, where people can say you're going to prison, can't really tell you why, because if we tell you why it's a breach of national security. And so what the through line for me is that national security has been used over the last 20 years, almost to always be a loophole to target Muslims, to take due process for Muslims or people who are, you know, of course, eventually that's, that, that branched out into black identity extremists and found ways to hit other communities in harder ways than they were already hit. But for me, just the whole national security apparatus justified for many Americans that the government can do whatever they want, when they want, with who they want um, in, the, in, 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 the, in the larger cause of, you know, keeping America safe. Thanks, Linda. So I want to now turn to Ramla, who is in San Diego and runs um, PANA and works with um, diverse refugee populations in the area. Um, so Ramla, tell us a little bit about a through line that you're seeing just emerge now that you could trace back to some of the policies after 9-11 and how it's affecting the communities you work with. I, I mean, I appreciate everything um, that's been said. And I think, you know, 9-11 led to some of the most brutal and inhumane war practices the world has ever seen. In Afghanistan, especially in Guantanamo, uh, and the surveillance, deportation, and the rest of innocent Muslims in the U.S. that uh, Linda just mentioned. Um, but I want to I wanna go back and just kind of... Um, help under you know to help us understand our country's immoral and inhumane response in the aftermath of 9 11 we have to also acknowledge the legacy of white supremacy in our approach to foreign policy um just so we're on the same page it's the genocide of our indigenous people it's slavery the annexation of territories and the overthrow of governments across the world it wields military force and economic sanctions to further u.s business interests crippling countries for their natural resources very early on in um, on, in the war, um, under brutal U.S. bombing, the Taliban attempted to send, surrender. Um, and I, I think that is also something that's always not talked about or lifted up. So the Taliban attempted to surrender completely. And instead, our government chose that moment as an opportunity not to end suffering of Afghan civilians, but to wage a 20-year war, unwinnable war, at a cost of $2 trillion and hundreds and thousands of lives lost. And the flagrant abuse of power by the Bush administration and that Obama continued ignored international law, our own, our own constitution, and absolutely betrayed our, our humanity. Um, and it's really extended. Um, it, it is a war on terror across the globe, right? Meaning using drone, drone strikes to target US citizens in places like Yemen and Somalia, right? And so despite the 20 years, 
The chaotic exit and absolute failure of the Afghan government makes evident that war only enriches private business and paramilitary contractors. It produced a failed state, millions of refugees and policies domestically like the Muslim and African bans. And as the US prepares to resettle Afghan refugees, we're left scrambling to figure it out because we don't have a way right now for newcomers um, who are arriving as humanitarian parolees to adjust their status, for example, because humanitarian parolee is a temporary status, right? Um, access to resources, so how do we house and support folks? Um, and so, you know, this, this lack of planning, this lack of um, commitment to justice, right? But this commitment to revenge is, I think, this country's uh, downfall. Thank you so much, Ramlan. I really appreciate you talking about the war on terror and its impact um, in other countries. I think in this conversation about the aftermath of 9-11, um, we have to remember and also um, uh, make sure that there's accountability for what has been going on for 20 years and actually even before that. Um, so the next question I want to ask you all is um, a little bit related to what Arthi started to talk about, where she mentioned some of the gaps, right, when you have movements um, that are not necessarily talking to each other. Um, but the question I want to ask is a flip question, which is, um, what happens when we do co-conspire together? And, you know, all, each of you has worked on different campaigns from the Community Safety Act to um, you know, uh, issues around Asian Americans and COVID-related racism. There's so many different ways in which you're at these intersectional points. So can you share with us an example of what can happen when we conspire together in solidarity so that the people listening can learn from the experiences that you all have um, and utilize them in their own work? So I'm going to start with um, Linda, and then I'm going to go to Vince, Ramla, and Arthi. Uh, I really appreciate these kinds of questions um, because I think we often look at the back at the bad and what, what what are we doing wrong and what are the challenges and the obstacles and don't look back at the wins and the times when we kind of emerged from the dust of the impacts of all these different violences that our communities experience. When we work together, when we are intersectional, when we commit to never leaving anybody behind, we win. And it's happened actually every time. Anytime there has been a national debate, for example, on immigration, where we say, yeah, we'll work on national security loopholes and border security loopholes later, let us just do this. We always lose because the intention there is that we're going to sacrifice some people um, in order to try to at least see some progress. And in the times where I've been part of campaigns that won, it was a collective decision amongst a diverse coalition that says the Muslims are in, the immigrants are in, the LGBTQIA people are in, the black people are in, everybody's in. And, and, and making sure that all those communities feel centered and feel heard and feel integrated in a way that dignifies them. And that was the Community Safety Act, which is really a I believe a model campaign of police reform and police uh, kind of, you know, of course, you know, it wasn't the most transformative piece of legislation for a monster like the New York Police Department, but it was something that proved that poor, black, brown, working class people can beat multi millionaires and billionaires like Michael Bloomberg and those who are standing with him. We were able to beat police unions who in New York City are humongously powerful monsters that a lot of people can't defeat. Um, and we were able to prove by working together, by training more leadership in our community, by working across movements, by not selling each other out, by not saying that stop and frisk was a, a worse policy than surveillance or that surveillance of Muslims was worse than this. There was no uh, kind of oppression Olympics in that coalition. And eventually we got to a point where Mayor Bloomberg actually vetoed our legislation and the the headline said that, that, that the special interest groups, which were us, black and brown people, and poor people were special interest groups that we lost. And what we did was just a few weeks later, we went back for a rematch in the city council. And we were actually able to pass a veto proof majority against Bloomberg, who in fact pumped millions of dollars against city council members who were running for reelection. He was putting ads up across the city. I mean, it was a disaster. Right. But it was young, poor, working class, black and brown, LGBTQIA people, Muslims and white allies who literally bird dog 
city council members and said, listen, you're either with us or you're not with us. Which side are you on? And we won. And that was always that for me will always be a highlight of my career of seeing what it feels like for us to not have to fight for a seat at the table. We never had to humanize the Muslims. We never had to be like, hey, we're over here. We were there and we were welcomed and we were included in ways that we weren't nationally. And so I and of course, you know, CCR was um, key to that larger kind of um, Community Safety Act fight. And of course, the, 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 the lawsuit that they had which by the way, also engaged community. I remember during that trial having, you know, the, so for example, we had Muslim, like basically Muslims at the trial day. So the Muslims took an anchor day where we kind of packed the courthouse and kind of stood in for each other. So people didn't have to take the brunt of the work. And that was, that's the kind of kind of solidarity I saw over the last 20 years and what we really need moving forward to actually win for all our people. Thank you, Linda. And thanks for sharing some of the ways in which that particular campaign worked and why. Um, Vince, curious to know if um, there's something that you can share with us um, about an experience that you've had. Yes, thank you. And plus one, uh, Linda, thank you so much for raising that. And Linda was key to the success of not only um, the uh, Community Safety Act, but also the winning of the stop and frisk case because uh, the coalition uh, essentially stopped um, the, um, the 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 appeal uh, of our of our win in the stop and frisk case and set the groundwork for a really great win in terms of the case that we had. Um, on surveillance of Muslims in New Jersey. So uh, I'm a big fan and a big believer of that particular coalition, also bringing everybody together in such fantastic ways. And it's, you know, the stuff doesn't happen magically. There's a lot of work behind it, but it's great. Um, I would add that almost all of the issues that um, were raised today, that Ramla raised, that, that Linda raised, that RT raised, that the Center for Constitutional Rights has done cases on them. We challenged um, the communications management unit. We've uh, challenged uh, the torture of, of uh, an extraordinary rendition of uh, Meher Arar, a Syrian uh, citizen of, of Canada. We challenged the drone, drone strikes that the administration, Obama administration was doing in Yemen. And in each one of those issues, we didn't do it alone. Uh, Arti will tell you, um, and for those of you that don't know, Arti's organization and my organization, legal organizations are two of the organizations that work deeply with community that our work does not is not successful unless we have community leadership and community support and community backing. And um, in all of those cases, whether we're working with groups, groups on the ground, ground here or human rights groups in Yemen, um, we, we wouldn't have been successful in even raising the issues before the courts had we not had that deep sense of solidarity. There is one exception to it, um, which is the, which are the Guantanamo cases, and this is uh, to the uh, to the flip of your flip, Deepa. This is where the there is no movement around a particular issue. When Guantanamo happened, people were freaked the heck out. People were like I ain't touching those those guys. Those guys are terrorists. The worst of the worst. Uh, and even in particularly in black and brown communities, the people weren't trying to touch it. That's a, that's a situation where the lawyers moved forward and litigated those cases, litigated them successfully. Um, and over a period of time, organizers were able to bring people to those issues and to connect the issues of Guantanamo and the background issues to the issues that they care about in their community. So over a period of time, really the organizers moved and built movement around some of those issues. And where it really came to bear was uh, 2016, 2017, when the Muslim ban happened, because when we filed the first litigation challenging Guantanamo in 2002, nobody, and I mean nobody, wanted a part of that litigation. Here we, and here come Trump uh, talking about a Muslim ban, and all of the organizations were right there and ready to file litigation um, at that top level to be able to push back on this horrible discriminatory po uh, policy. So my view is that that 20 year lesson is that when you build trust, you act in integrity, you act with, um, you know, with, with fierce determination around your principles and with the help of organizers and storytellers um, over a period of time, you build the movement so that it doesn't take one organization um, to kick the government's ass when they do something done. It's the people that are doing it. It's extraordinary. Thank you so much, Vince. I feel that energy um, and momentum and courage. Um, and I wanna next go to Ramla, um, especially since you work 
you know, you're working at the border, right? Um, can you share an example of what has happened when you have um, co-conspired with others? The idea of co-conspiring is, is a practice that I think, you know, we, we should own. Um, I think often we go into coalition meetings and it's like, you know, we're doing the same thing we do every time we come together, we plan together, you know, but the idea of like setting an intention to co-conspire and being intentional about what that means and having shared principles, sh shared values around it is is critical. And an example I can share um, is our Trust SD coalition. So Trust SD stands for the Transparent Responsible Use of Surveillance Tech. Initially, it was an issue that a black man flagged um, who is, you know, a black Muslim um, in the historic black neighborhood of San Diego. Like, what is this about? Why do we have surveillance cameras all throughout our neighborhoods and why is it only targeting you know people of color and communities that are uh, low resourced um flagging that i think was really important as as we pulled together an intentional group of people um from you know the tech field who normally don't engage on people of color issues issues on civil rights you know um to you know the the the, the young person the community um young person who who understands the impact of surveillance on them as people who are stopped, who, you know, in San Diego, we have a history of law enforcement stopping young Somali men and asking them about their tribal affiliation, right? And, you know, making these connections about, you know, this surveillance camera is problematic, not because it's, you know, using CDBG dollars that are meant to actually help communities that are uh, in, in terms of building up their infrastructure, um, but it's bad because the history of law enforcement the targeting of black and brown communities and particularly black men in our communities um, under the context the context of like post 9-11 society and like how they're targeting particularly Somali Muslims in San Diego. Um, we could have very easily built a coalition that was just impacted people, right? But when you think critically about like what does it mean to co-conspire and who else do we need in this coalition to really help us make this argument and really push hard, um, it, you know, it was the privacy um, advocate in Rancho Bernardo who, you know, is well off, is a white man with graduate degrees, has no issue with the government look, you know, putting up street, you know, to him, it's like a fancy street light and we need that, right? We need more street lights. Um, but being intentional about building a coalition around just uh, and telling the story of not just how it impacts one community, but how it harms all of us was really intentional. And being and sitting with that, really telling the story of how it impacts all of us, so that we have a clear understanding of what it is that we need. And where do we, you know, what would we, what might have we done with those resources? What might, what could we do with $3 million in our community? Right. You know? And so right. having intentional conversations about where our values are and where we want to put our money where we, where we want our city government to focus uh, in in resourcing uh, that that really allowed us to build a broad tent of people and you know resulted in hundreds and hundreds of people who were unplanned you know we didn't even like most right. of the organizing was just catalytic right because it was so clear um hundreds and hundreds of people calling um and winning on that issue yeah, thank you. And I appreciate what you said, even from the top, right, about being intentional about co-conspiring, that it isn't something that we just do as a byproduct. It has to actually start there. And Arthi, um, just turning to you for the last word on this, um, I know you all have worked on, you know, as Vince pointed out, a lot of different issues, right? I don't know if you can share just one example, but if you could, um, is there anything that you would add to some of these elements of co-conspiring that we've already heard from our friends? Yeah, I mean, well, strategically, I think one of the things that's happened is because we've been unable to move things and through Congress at a federal level, we are interrupting systems at the local level. And that you see all over the place. And one example has been um, uh, with the Joint Terrorism Task Forces. So these are, you know, people don't even know that they exist. And these are partnerships between the FBI and local police um, and one of the main challenges of these partnerships is when local police partner with the FBI, they don't have to follow due process. They don't need probable cause to go interview someone. And so all of these civil rights protections that are there in the law fly out the window. 
And we um, saw um, this partnership in action early in like 2014 when a Google, Google engineer who went to visit his parents in Pakistan, uh, one day a police officer and an FBI agent together showed up at his workplace to interview him in San Francisco. And um, that's when, you know, we started seeing, okay, this is this partnership in action. And then you fast forward and um, what happened um, after the um, protests, after the tragic killing of George Floyd, you know, um, you had Bill Barr, the attorney general, to activate these joint terrorism task forces and basically target uh, all the protesters, calling them Antifa, calling them these radical protesters. And in that time period, we know there's been surveillance. There's been surveillance of Muslim communities and Black um, uh, activists. And so we were able to, um, through local coalitions, both in San Francisco, but more recently, about a year ago in Oakland, uh, working hand in hand with um, Black, Latinx, Indigenous activists in locally um, basically have the Oakland City Council stop their um, partnership with the FBI, which was, and it was unanimous, you know, um, and that would not have happened. And I absolutely agree that um, this is building trust and partnership over years. We've been working with these folks for a really long time. Um, and we're able to come together on this issue, which once again, like so many of the issues, as Vince mentioned, are issues that people don't want to touch, right? right. Um, that we were able to come together and get this, um, get, you know, the city of Oakland to walk away from this partnership. And um, I think this is, to me, there is so much hope now because I feel like the new generation of advocates and activists really pause and stop and listen to each other and deeply understand the systems and issues that each community is facing and also see that often it's the same system. Right. And so that um, to me is the way forward. You know, we're not going to Thank make you. change without multiracial coalition and, and, and deep relationships, not transactions. Right. I think that all four of you have made that really clear, right? That these are not, these are transformative relationships that change both yourselves and your organizations, but the communities that you work with. I'm so grateful to all of you, Vince, Arthi, Linda, Ramla, for this conversation, for your insights and more than anything, your friendship and camaraderie. Miss you all deeply. Um, we are going to um, say goodbye to you for now. <laughs> um, so thank you. And um, I want to actually move us um, before we get to our final uh, uh, panel or conversation on collaboration. I'm really excited to welcome another one of our young poets. Um, we're going to be hearing from Pebbles Love. And Pebbles is um, a Filipina and Okinawan B-girl artist actress and young organizer. And Pebbles also, just like Mayel, is part of uh, BMP and Solidarity is his Power Up internship program and has spent um, this past summer working with Nakasak. Um, so we're really excited to welcome uh, Pebbles, who's going to share um, a performance that is really, really focused on um, collaboration and some of what we're talking about today. Pebbles, turning it over to you. Hello, hello. Thank you so much for the wonderful introduction. Hello, everyone. It is truly an honor to be here and to share space with you all. Um, today, I'll be performing two of my poems, and I hope you enjoy. Peace, it's pebbles, Filipina and Okinawan, ancestors colonized, and now we rebels on the rise to the port of liberation, a dream about another nation. One without walls, prisons, and deportation. Enough of this feeling of alienation. We've been throwing down since the BC. A messed up system is not what we want, but that's all we see. We want justice for our schools and communities, pre-K to universities. Black and brown youth going to school not having to worry. 
Worry about getting snatched up and thrown into prisons or ice tearing up families. They say trust in America, but then I got trust issues. Couldn't wipe away the trauma even with the tissue. They abuse the legislation, pull you in with the temptation, locked up in their cages. It's time for a new chapter in these pages. Instilling fear, that's a tactic. Thinking that we're hidden, but the community is active. They see us as a threat, so they press the power games, using our protests for the blame and wanting us to be tamed. So scared to unravel what's underneath the band-aid. You're too liberty, they say. Why don't you follow the white supremacist way? <laughs> I guess I don't fit your agenda. Didn't look like what you fantasized, so then you fictionalized. How do we move in a system that continues to be so anti? This is a world cry. So I say, keep a checking hand up. Let's organize, strategize for the future that we visualize. Take care of ourselves, land, and our people prioritize. So as I wrap this up, we need to emphasize that we are here in solidarity for the movement for Black Lives. Thank you. And for my second poem, um, this one is called A Dream of Abolition. Abolition, wishing for abolition, dreaming of a world with collective liberation. I don't want to drown in oppression or be swayed by white supremacist temptations. Want to live where everyone is freed from the shackles. We are lifted. Let's get lifted. Let's get lifted. Don't sleep on the strength that revolutionary love holds from the new gen to the old, continuing the fight to abolish a system because we are too radical to fit in their mold. We must hold each other close, hold each other accountable, for together we will get there, get to our dream, to be free, to be free. Thank you so much. Pebbles, that was really powerful. And I'm sitting here holding what you said um, about taking care of ourselves, our land, and our people. That really resonates. And it is such a wonderful um, opening to our next panel, which is actually about collaboration. So thank you so much, Pebbles. Appreciate you. Um, so now I want to turn it over to um, Sean Thomas. Breitfeld, the co-director of the Building Movement Project, who is going to talk with us in conversation with four more members of the Solidarity Summit about collaboration. Sean, turning it over to you now. So much, uh, Deepa, and thanks also to all of the folks who have been uh, with us for the past uh, hour plus uh, talking about solidarity and the lessons uh, and you know legacy from the last 20 years. Uh, as Deepa mentioned, we are going to be talking about co-liberation. And when we're talking about co-liberation, we're both talking about like the commitment to liber the, to the liberation of all of us and also like intentionally refraining from engaging in tactics uh, and wedge narratives that keep us separated. And so just really want to center that as we uh, welcome this next panel. Um, so... Well, I am joined by Ahmad Abuznaid from the U.S. Campaign for Palestinian Rights, Ashley Henderson from the Highlander Research and Education Center, Judith LeBlanc from the Native Organizers Alliance, and Pedro Rios from the American Friends Service Committee. Um, and so we're really going to pick up on what uh, the last panel, Linda... Ramla, Arthi, and Vince were talking about in terms of the you know, multi-racial solidarity as a transformative strategy. Um, and really excited to dig into where we're headed uh, and the lessons that have been learned uh, that we can bring into our, that we are bringing into our movements today. And so the first question that I'm gonna pose to each of you is invite you to give an example of how you've seen you know, new synergy, alignment, the emerging of ideas and strategies across different movements uh, over the past 20 years. I'm gonna start with Ashley, then uh, Pedro, Judith, and then Ahmad. Ashley, where have you seen, or can you share an example of 
uh, that kind of synergy alignment and merging of ideas and strategies and movements over the last 20 years. Thanks so much for the question, Sean. And just shout out to Deepa and all of the Solidarity Summit fam. It is, uh, you are seeing a family reunion live and in living color. Um, so also just to be here uh, with this particular co you know, collaboration of humans who I love, it's, it's a blessing to see your faces. Um, I think the, the, the thing that's important to me about my answer to this question is that though there are particular contextual lessons to learn from what we've seen over the last 20 years, us and our people rolling together ain't a new phenomenon. That actually indigenous, black, Palestinian, other comrades from all over the global South and the US South in particular is as old as the systems of oppression that have attempted to keep us apart from one another. Um, and so I think what we have seen in the last 20 years, which is similar to what we've seen over the last 50 years, is a is a re literally a remembering of those practices, of those relationships, of those cultural ways of being together. And why that's mattered in the last 20 years is I feel like it's super easy for the state and for our enemies that are rooted in white supremacist, nationalist and paramilitary forces, uh, folks that are benefiting uh, the minority of people, in fact, who are benefiting holistically from concentrating the wealth, their wealth and power through racialized patriarchal capitalism uh, would tell us a story that centers us as victims that have to come together uh, because we're not powerful. When in fact, the story is, an, is the exact opposite. We're so powerful that we keep them constantly at, at, at threat, right? They're worried that they are losing. Um, as Eric Ward said, we might be winning. And what I feel like we've learned, not only is it's not new that we need to continue to, to remember our, our practices of solidarity, but that when we do, we win. And when we win, they respond. Um, I feel like that's what we've seen over the last 20 years, that when we came together uh, to build a powerful anti-war movement, the state responded. When we've come together across our differences to demand a free Palestine, they have threatened our funding, they have threatened our very lives. Uh, when we came together in defense of Black lives, even last year or during Ferguson or the Baltimore uprising or the Charlotte's uprising or any of the, the many, many times that Black liberation has led at the forefront, uh, what we have seen is a dramatic response from the state and all of those that would see us not win. Um, and so I think the, the biggest lesson for me over the last 20 years um, is that that strategy not only is transformative, but it wins, <laughs> that it wins and that now we need to be building the infrastructure and relationships that are powerful enough to sustain those wins. Thanks so much, Ashley. And, you know, great to have that reminder that the past 20 years is a re-remembering of lessons of the past centuries, right? Um, Pedro, what have you been seeing? What are the uh, examples of merged ideas across movements that you can share? Yeah, thank you. Thank you. And, and it's such a pleasure and, and a wonder for me to be here and sharing this space with all of you. It's exciting to see all of you here uh, together. And, and that's a great question because one of the things that I've noticed over the past uh, several years has been that the state also has consolidated its power in a way that that uh, obligates us to have to remember and bring up what our generations have been telling us for a long time. So some of the, and I'll provide an example of what, what that is, uh, precisely um, my work on border issues and in, on immigration issues generally, what I've seen is how the Border Patrol attempted to market itself as a national police force showing up and repressing uh, the um, movement around uh, Black Lives Matter protests. Uh, in San Diego, they were sharing uh, armament with the San Diego Sheriff's uh, Department. And then we saw them in other parts of the, of the country. But what I reflect on, for instance, is one of the trainings that we do here in San Diego uses this uh, old uh, um, African teaching, which is uh, until the uh, lions have their own historians. The stories of the greatest hunt will always glorify the hunter. And so we ask ourselves, well, with whom do we align? Are, are we, uh, you know, are we running with uh, the lions? Are we uh, the, the hunter? And so looking at those power dynamics for me is an important way to answer this question. And so that's where we start building our solidarity because then we start telling our stories, we start telling our truths. And it's in those telling of those truths and those uh, stories and testimonies that we discover that we have a lot of similarities with our sisters and brothers who also are part of a what might appear to be a different movement, but really it's a it's part of the larger 
similar movement. And so um, looking at those ways of, of drawing from our past to bring them up to our present, and then it makes sense that when we make the, when we say that Black Lives Matter, we're, you know, reaffirming our own humanity as we affirm our sisters and brothers' humanity in that. So that's, that's where I see the solidarity and the merging of ideas and, and strategies that we can then enter into a dialogue where we're not uh, distant, uh, but we're really, uh, you know, close siblings as we're moving together in this struggle. Thanks so much. And, you know, it, it's so interesting because part of what you're also bringing up is that the forces opposed to our liberation are learning and innovating too, right? So like we have to keep uh, doing the learning work on our side and we also have to be anticipating uh, that opposition and that backlash as well. Um, Judith, what are you seeing in terms of how uh, different movements are uh, having new forms of alignment and uh, shared strategy and collaboration? that it is always it, it has always been and will always be necessary to come together as a whole to bring the different pieces of life and cultures together and the truth is that when there's a big interruption like 9-11 was the launching of wars the incredible break in continuity both in in uh, the economy, socially, politically, spiritually, there was a rebuilding and a response just as we're seeing right now with COVID. And the truth is that the anti-war movement that grew out of 9-11 was not your grandma's anti-war movement. It was profoundly and consciously anti-racist and saw a necessity and struggled it out that half of the leadership of the biggest national coalition United for Peace and Justice must be 50% people of color. We made connections between the war in Iraq, Afghanistan and Palestine and the domestic impact of militarism. We, we knew very much about the need to bring communities of color into the lead because militarism and the poverty draft had caused our peoples to be fighting a war for oil an unjust war, where the initial invasion of Iraq, 10% of the boots on the ground were American Indians, and we're less than 5% of the population. And so that interruption, 9-11 and the launching of this endless wars, um, I think set an example that now is, is just understood that whenever there's something egregious that the government does, some practice, some proposal, then people take it into the streets. Because you have to remember that the Patriot Act was passed criminalizing protests and the first movement into the streets was the Palestine Solidarity Movement and the anti-war movement. And so now we're in a situation and we've seen since then that every moment, every moment that arises where there's a crisis, people go take action. They challenge the narrative, Black Lives Matter, the dreamers, the fight for 15, the fast food workers, the, the women's from Standing Rock, all in rapid succession. And in, in some ways, the interruption of COVID has compelled us to think about how do we weave the needs? How do we figure out what the commonalities are to move the majority without some hierarchy of interests, but really thinking about it as a gumbo. Like how do we bring people together so that our commonalities, our common opposition to systemic roots of oppression, economic, racial oppression, that's the common denominator. And people think like that without a lot of prodding. They start thinking about it in communities all across uh, communities and and it's it, it's a higher level than pre 9/11. 20 years ago, before 9/11, it it was not a foregone conclusion that you think about the system or the impact of militarism or the absolute necessity for the leadership of movements to be led by people of color. 
Thanks so much. Yeah, I mean, so great to be reminded that there has been a shift in consciousness in uh, our communities and in our movements. Uh, Ahmad, what are you seeing in response to this question as you think about different movements uh, today compared to 20 years ago? Uh, well, thanks for the opportunity to be here with you all. Sending much love to all my um, Solidarity Summit family. Uh, I can't wait to be together with you in person again and um, sharing all the joy that we have. Uh, you know, I have to lift up uh, the plight of our political prisoners. Um, all of our different communities have suffered under the carceral state or the carceral systems that, you know, imprison us from Palestine to here. And I think, you know, as we're hearing the call from the Movement for Black Lives for abolition, we understand how that impacts our political prisoners. And so we lift up the call to free them all. And I'm very proud for the U.S. campaign for Palestinian rights to be a part of that call. And, and just to note how, again, to Ashley's point, this connects to where we were historically and not just 20 years. Angela Davis, you know, um, one of the elders we frequently look to, um, talks a lot about during her time in prison, um, the letters that she received from Palestinian women prisoners um, imprisoned by Israel, how those letters encouraged her, inspired her, and, and you know, uh, let her know that she was not alone in her opposition to the carceral state and to these carceral systems. So I have to lift up abolition and the will to free them all um, out of uh, these prisons. I also want to look up historically delegations, how delegations have played such a huge role for us, um, both historically uh, folks going to Palestine, but also more recently the Dream Defenders delegations and Eyewitness Palestine delegations to Palestine and the delegations from Palestine that came to Ferguson, that came to Chicago, that came to Miami to build with us. The last example I want to lift up, which I think Again, all kudos and, and uh, props and love to the Movement for Black Lives is um, the Movement for Black Lives policy platform in 2016. You know, we had all uh, learned from uh, the movement to boycott South African apartheid. We had all learned from the Montgomery bus boycott and the boycotts of Woolworths and the civil rights movement. And so the Palestinian movement called for BDS, boycott, divestment and sanctions. Um, and soon we saw that, you know, the solidarity was there from our comrades here in the US. And so within the Movement for Black Lives policy platform released in 2016, we saw an invest-divest framework or a divest-invest framework unveiled that, that showed us that, you know, M4BL was giving this country a roadmap to, for the first time ever, divest from war and devastation and death, and for the first time ever to be invested in black futures and indigenous futures and, 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 and futures of civil rights and freedom. And so, I want to lift up those examples because, you know, sometimes we're um, beating ourselves, uh, attempting to reinvent the wheel. But sometimes those lessons are right there for us. Um, boycott, divestment and sanctions. So shout out to South African um, freedom strugglers against apartheid and shout out to the movement for black lives and all of our comrades here with us today. Thanks so much. Yeah. And so we're going to move on to the second question for this panel, which is about um, you know, what What lessons would you want to impart or share with younger folks who are coming into multiracial movement spaces? Um, Judith, I'm going to start with you uh, and invite you to share any uh, lessons that you want to impart to the younger folks who are joining us today and who will be watching this on YouTube in the future. Well, I think it's important for all of us to remember that Organizations come and go. They only, they only are significant um, when we understand that movements go on forever. Movements are not controlled by one organization or a handful of organization, but they provide an infrastructure for the grassroots to express in very demonstrative ways their opposition or their support for something new, for a horizon goal. And if we look at each period of history and we understand that, that there are organizations who, who can play an important role, but the movements are what go on forever, then the way that you work in your community, how you are accountable to your community will have a bigger and broader perspective because we all, all of us, black, 
Lives Matter, Native uh, Organizers Alliance, AFSC, the U.S. Campaign for Palestinian Rights. We have to see our work within the whole. Like, are we contributing to building a broader and deeper solidarity that can withstand differences of opinion? Because movements walk in the same direction. They're not necessarily walking on the same path, and that can be okay. We know that in history, and there's been so many great movies like The Night uh, in Miami and this new movie out now about Muhammad Ali and Malcolm X. There's been so many things that have uh, cultural uh, analysis of history where walking in the same direction is so important and that we must have an open heart and an open mind and act with discernment and think about movements, not just narrow organizational uh, considerations. Thanks so much, Judith. Pedro, what lesson would you want to impart to younger folks coming into movement spaces today? Yeah, thank you. And, and I really uh, I really hold uh, deeply when uh, Judith was talking about uh, accountability. And, and what comes to mind are two lessons. One related to the issue of accountability is how do we ensure that there is intentional mentorship taking place so that there is a direct uh, intention in how we connect with younger folks and how we connect with elders as well. Um, I, you know, I, I feel that in, in my introduction to movement work, that was missing. And so it's important for that uh, continuation and, and legacy of struggle to continue in an intentional and conscientious way. And the second point, is communication. Communication nowadays is, is done in a much more fast food type of, of way that I feel oftentimes misses the mark of, of why we would want to communicate, especially with our elders. So many of our elders are, are uh, moving from this world and moving into the spirit world. And there's so many lessons there that could be learned, that could be um, really nourished in a way to build up a society that we want to uphold hold where dignity reigns, where respect is a, a principle that upholds uh, every every aspect of the work that we do. Um, and then those are the two lessons. Then lastly, uh, to say, you know, for, for those of us who are a little bit older, there is a lot that we can also learn from, from younger folks, right? And uh, I'm still learning from uh, younger folks who are involved in movement work that remind me uh, of of why movement work is important that uh, that show me uh, a path that perhaps I, I might have missed along the way. Yeah, thanks. It's such a great reminder that, you know, mentorship at its best is leading to the growth of people at both ends of the generational experience, right? That both uh, people in that relationship are being transformed and growing. Um, Ahmad, what uh, lessons would you want to impart to younger folks coming into movement spaces? Thanks, Sean. Yeah, so I, I uh, alluded to one of them in my earlier comments in, in saying we don't need to reinvent the wheel. And this actually relates to the second point I was going to give, which is, you know, study, uh, read up on the movement, uh, study up on our people's histories, on our histories of resistance. Um, you know, a lot of times folks look at the Dream Defenders and they think, you know, for instance, like we were a part of like the birth of this black and Palestinian solidarity. But, you know, a lot of us are being educated about that um, relationship historically. And, and if you were to look at, for instance, the local fights that were happening in the city of Detroit, for example, you know that black, Arab, Latino, white workers um, from the automotive plants united to make sure that United Auto Workers would divest from Israeli bonds. And so we can find a lot of the lessons um, if, we read, if we would just read and lean into some of the history. Now, it doesn't mean we have to do it exactly as they did it, but there's so many lessons to be taken away there. So th that's kind of a combination, learning and studying the history of our movements, of our peoples, but also no need to reinvent the wheel. And then Thanks, the, the, the last one I'll add is, um, Operating from a, a framework of abundance as opposed to scarcity. Uh, this was a big one for me. You know, the ability to dream and envision what we need to build requires of us to, to operate within a framework of abundance rather than scarcity. Um, and this, this works uh, as it relates to fundraising, but, but even, you know, when we're dreaming up 
um, direct actions and we need more bodies. You know, we need more people. We need more comrades. You know, I, I, I happen to think that if we dream it and we envision it, we can inspire it and we can build it. So um, abundance versus scarcity. Thank you thanks, so much. Sean. Yeah, thanks. And so I'm going to bring it uh, back to you, Ashley, in terms of lessons. And, you know, I think the, as Ahmad was saying, like this, what you, the point you made it originally, like re-remembering that, you know, the solidarity has existed over centuries. It's not a new practice or a new phenomenon. What other lessons would you, or are you, what other lessons are you imparting to young folks coming into movement spaces, uh, particularly from the vantage point of the Highlander Center and the role that you all have played in movements over generations? Yeah, I mean, again, intergenerational, multi-generational power building gets the goods. It's why intergenerational organizing is a methodology that Highlander has been helping to support uh, and accompany organizations and communities to understand how to do excellently uh, for almost 90 years. We'll be 90 years young next year. Um, you know, this could be a whole panel topic on its own, uh, but just to amen what I've heard and to add a few things, uh, you know, I think it's important to know the difference between a strategy and tactics. I feel like um, in the last few years uh, in moments where we didn't have anything to lose and had everything to lose, uh, that we some of us have gotten really good at throwing tactical spaghetti at the wall and just praying something sticks. Um, but that is not a, you know, to Mott's, Ahmed's point is like, it's not a, it's not a vision. It's not a strategy. It's not a long-term goal. And what we're contending with is people who are not only thinking long-term about strategy, but are in the process of implementing a 50-year strategy that they came up with, you know, years ago. Um, and we need a strategy and we need to be able to clearly articulate that vision and strategy to our people. Otherwise, we are in a grand stage of experimentation that we will not be able to sustain. Uh, you know, I think that it's important for us to remember that we live in the past, present and future all at the same time every day. And we should be considering that as as we develop these strategies and tactical interventions to Ahmed's point. We're not the first, last or only to do this work. <laughs> um, and so we can learn from what has been, but we can also not get stuck in our ways by leaning into the vision and the, the innovation of younger generations who are demanding that we not just concede <laughs> to what we believe is possible based on the contemporary conditions, uh, but that we demand what we deserve regardless of what the state says we deserve, what they say we are valuable for, all of those things. I think it's important that we remember that accountability is important, but accountability is not punishment, right? If we haven't learned anything in the last 20 years post 9-11 is that punishment does not transform relationships. It does not transform communities. It does not transform conditions. What it does is harm people, even with the best of intentions. Punishment is not our goal, abolition and accountability is, and perfection is not required for you to be on the side of bending the, the moral arc of the universe towards justice. I mess up every day and I have to be accountable for it, but it doesn't mean that the way that we get to transforming how we're in right relationship happens through punishment. We know that to have been a failure. I would, I would say in closing, you know, that political difference arises be, be get comfortable with it. I would say that finally, like what I'm learning from young people is threefold. I really agree with my comrades who have said, like, I actually think the, the real question is what do we have to be learning from young people over the last 20 years? Um, and I think that what I've learned is like, we need to be asking really sharp questions about who the state is criminalizing who the state is telling us is the bad guy, right? Talk about a lesson, right? The state told us all sorts of lies post 9-11 about who we should hate, about who were the bad people, about who we should criminalize. And we need to be asking questions about who that serves. Who, why, would, why would it serve me to be upset with undocumented people in this country, knowing that this country is, is nine times out of 10, the reason why their countries are, are, are places where they would have to flee in the first place, right? Why would I hate my, my other working class brothers, sisters and siblings when actually we have more in common than the enemy that is trying to keep us squarely in these class stratifications, right? Like we need to be asking the question of who does it serve to, to see them as the other of me? 
to see them as the opposition of me, the people that are trying to get something to be over me versus actually practicing solidarity with them. And I think towards that point of solidarity, what I'm learning from young people is how do we build solidarity in a way that is not codependent and transactional, but interdependent interdependent and sustainable. Like that's actually the work that I feel like so many of us in the Solidarity Summit are experimenting with, is how do we be in right relationships that are not just you scratch my back and I'll scratch yours when the time comes, is not also building codependency so that it's like we have to be good fighters, but we can't actually be good winners and then just sustain those victories. I think that's the work of solidarity in this 21st century context. Thank you so much to all four of you for joining this conversation. Really appreciate uh, the insights that you've shared and uh, the opportunity to see the magic of the Solidarity Summits in uh, real time. And I'm going to pass it back to Deepa right now. Thank you, family. Really appreciate seeing you here. Really grateful to all of you. Um, this was um, a really, really remarkable teaching. And for those of you who are watching, can you imagine what it's like when everyone is actually in person? Um, because it is um, a really tremendous energy and momentum coming together. So I'm gonna close our teaching with just a few um, ways to synthesize and next steps. So I'm gonna ask um, Catherine, who has been helping backstage um, to show us our, um, our slides. And so, you know, one of the things that we often talk about um, with solidarity is, is around what are the principles for transformative solidarity practice that we can experiment with and learn from. You likely heard a lot of these principles being shared by the folks that you heard today. Um, we heard about the importance, especially as we are talking about a 9-11 teaching, of centering communities that have been affected, being informed by their leadership. We heard about what can happen when we co-conspire and not sacrifice or compromise um, communities. We heard about the importance of identifying commonalities and connections, especially as Muslim, Arab, South Asian, Sikh groups built together at a time of crisis. We also heard about the importance of building capacity and care. Um, because in order to do this work, as Judith reminded us, it's a long-term struggle. Movements are long-term struggles that go past even organizational life cycles. So how do we sustain? Um, as Ashley reminds us, how do we learn from each other um, and create this intergenerational spectrum of learning? So these are some of the principles that we wanted to highlight that, that um, you may have picked up on during the solidarity teaching. And you'll find more of this information online at buildingmovement.org. So what do you do with this information, right? We've, we've shared a lot here. Um, so what exactly um, can you do if you are listening in? So if you are part of an organization or connected to a network, um, whether that's a campus group or whether it's an organization with thousands of followers, you could think about um, whether it makes sense for your organization to do a solidarity statement or to enter into partnership with many of the organizations that we've talked about here. If you're in philanthropy, you could think about um, figuring out ways to actually move more resources to support movements like the ones that we heard about today. Um, in fact, there is a pledge that is out there coming from foundations who are interested in investing um, significant resources to Black, Arab, Muslim, South Asian, Sikh communities at this time during the anniversary. That is a pledge that foundations could join. If you're an educator or if you're a student, um, hopefully this teaching has allowed you to connect some of the dots between policies and practices that occurred in the wake of 9-11 and what we're seeing today. And lastly, please support the organizations that you have heard about here and the people who come from the communities that have been affected, particularly in the 20 years after 9-11, um, whether they are organizers, whether they are refugees, whether they are movement leaders, whether they are people in your community, neighbors, students, um, this is a time to support and extend that care. So 
with that, I um, also want to share with you a couple of other events that are being hosted over the next month. Um, you know, as we keep saying, uh, the impact of 9-11 and understanding it keeps going well beyond the anniversary date. Um, so here are a couple of events that were mentioned today, especially around um, honoring Balbir Singh Sodhi, um, who was killed 20 years ago on September 15th. Um, also, a lot of um, cultural ways and narratives that you can um, take part in and understand. The Justice for Muslims Collective is doing um, a program called Counter Narrating the War on Terror Through Muslim Eyes, and South Asian Americans Leading Together, or SALT, is doing a mini docu series and interactive digital exhibition. So these are just some of the events that are being organized through Solidarity um, Summit organizations and allies. And finally, um, wanting to share with you a a resource in Spotlight, um, Teaching Beyond September 11th, which comes out of the University of Pennsylvania and is a multimodal curriculum for educators and students about the ongoing global impact of 9-11. Um, we here at BMP and Solidarity has contributed to this curriculum. We hope that you'll check it out um, because it is another way to ensure that we don't have sanitized and incomplete narratives about what has happened since September 11th and in its aftermath. And we hope you'll stay connected. We would love to stay in touch with you. We would love to partner with you, learn from you, and co-conspire with you. These are all ways that you can contact us and learn about our Solidarity Schools, our Solidarity Assist podcast, and the resources and reports that Building Movement Project produces. Um, you can find all of that on our website and also by contacting us and staying in touch with um, what we're putting out there to strengthen nonprofits and social movement spaces. So with that, um, I want to take a moment to actually bring to our front stage all of the people that have made this teaching possible. Um, They're here, um, and I want to thank um, Anna and Sean and Kitty, Safaya, Simran, um, who have been part of putting this teaching together. Obviously, want to thank all of the folks um, from the Solidarity Summit um, who joined us over the course of the last couple of hours um, to give us your insights and learnings. We have all benefited. So thank you for being here. We look forward to continuing to be in partnership with you. Take good care of yourselves. Bye-bye.